put up as a team and there'll be guys who only do CAD and only do parts of CAD and never get to touch anything. Every one of these guys got to give it to Every one of these guys is blood on that robot. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's a unique opportunity for the people's so, yeah. Thanks very much, Bill. Thank, Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Director of CTE, Heather Sheridan Thomas, Thomas, who's our Assistant Superintendent for Instruction. Uh, Jeff Podalek is here, and he is our CTE principal. Rick Miller is back here, Director of Technology. And, sorry, Dave, and Dave Pitcher, <laughs> Supervisor of Building and Ground and Transportation. So we're all here if you have any questions in those areas. Obviously, uh, so we're here uh, for you. We are in the Director of Specialized Economy and Financial Conflict. Um, but I'll, I'll just move along while he's um, setting this up. Really, just the, the first part, very brief overview uh, about both teams and our mission. Our mission is to, they're very good. You know, you got to start it up. Can you get it closer? Mm -hmm. Superb. The most important part of our mission is hard to the line, is that we want to offer high quality services that are economical and efficient and complement your education. <coughs> Everyone in our organization knows that even if they're not in the uh, hardcore instructional end of things, that everything they do to build an efficiency to save you money or to generate aid for you is money that goes back into your classroom. So all the saving you money is money you don't have to spend on something else to go back into the classroom. So we see ourselves as an extension of your mission. We provide specialized educational opportunities leadership for current educational initiatives, shared services, and cross contracts with the OCs. <coughs> the next couple slides, we'll go over each one of those in a little bit more detail. If you have any questions, you can stop me at any point. Specialized educational services, um, exceptional education, a lot of our special education programs right on our campus in school. Um, the alternative education program, which is now housed on our campus, between the Smith School and the CTE, program that has been um, on our campus. We've had an increase in enrollment in our alternative program and we have had an increase in the number of students in our alternative program taking CTE courses now as well on campus. So that's been a big win for us, not to mention the financial savings. Parent technology practical education is the other educational program on our campus that is expanding again this year and you'll see that in the budget. Leadership for current educational initiatives. Um, Educational excellence, um, poor learning standards, teacher evaluation, everything breaks the top driven. Um, your region, our region, uh, got together, and I would have to say that the way this has been carried out in our region to race the top, common core standards, APPR, data driven instruction, the people working together, so excellent leadership, um, Dr. Sheridan Thomas, and uh, our instruction support personnel, plus your folks in the district, for the superintendent has really resulted in a lot of great things happening uh, in our region. I've been getting them out of the schools, checking out classrooms, seeing how the educational phone agenda, agenda is taking hold, seeing some great things, <laughs> including in New York District. We support the Big League for All Students Act with Youth Development Specialists, and our Youth Development Specialists are doing other things around youth development in the schools as well. Response to intervention, inclusive education, and special design instruction. 
Uh, we also administer state grants for special education as well. And there's a grant funded instructional services person that works with um, our districts in need as well. And that is run through BOCES and they're housed on our campus. Shared services is a list of all the shared services. These are the not just the aid generators, but also those efficiencies and savings that are built in uh, to the regional program. Most often of these are shared with another school district or shared with BOCES to save you money so you don't have to have a full-time person or that you don't do these things itself. Cross contracts. We will be the pass-through for cross contracts or other BOCES for you. Often there are some unique um, programs that some school districts are looking for uh, that is not offered in our region, but we can help you or assist you by looking at another BOCES and can provide that very same service. We even purchase um, services as part of BOCES to cross contracts. So we are the pass-through for that, um, and we're glad to help out with that as well. Because the most important thing is that our school districts are getting the things that they need to support the education for their children. We also administer grants. Uh, we seek out grant funding. Uh, we work with you and partner with you for grant funding, and then we administer the grant funding. So each personnel does a lot of this. You can see in the past year, we administered a, a million, over a million and a half of grants to our school district. The more grants we can get um, to support your educational program, the less tax dollars or aid you need to depend on moving forward. Excuse me, how many people uh, do you have? It depends, it depends on which um, program the grant is coming from. Like this school library media, the folks in that area would write the grant. We don't have a separate grant writing service, um, but the people in those particular programs are writing the grants or partnering with some of the local district to write the grant. Yeah, so in most cases, it's at the actual coordinator, so for school library services, it's one person who wrote, writes those grants. So it's we don't have a grant it's mostly writer. one person. We do not have a grant writer. Occasionally, if we're working on a very large grant, particularly in collaboration with another district, we may, the district and, and BOCES may decide to use an existing grant writer from some of the other BOCES do have, and we can cross contract if it's a large grant that merits that. But most of the time, it's us doing the, you know, the coordinator themselves. We don't have a grant writer, do we, Michael? So some of these things you don't like grants for, right? Or some of them some of those kind of block grants that come from the state. <laughs> That's what I mean. They it's just pass them through us. That's what I mean. Usually there's, there's still an preparation right? education aid. That's yeah, there's, yeah, right? there's usually yeah. still an application you got to fill out, right. and you have to fill out the budget. Well, you, you have, have to the process the spending of the money, right? And right. What yeah. I'm figuring out is, you know, what does it cost you to process these dollars? Right. That is one of the questions. Well, that's the advantage of having the CBO too, because you can pass through, and all the districts are sharing that pass-through um, work back up at BOCES, so it's not really differentiated between districts. A lot of times those grants go to multiple districts, drivers can do it for both, so you don't have to have your own person. So to get to your individual profile for your school district and to look at the administrative budget, I'm going to allow uh, Dave Parson to take you through that. Thank you. The, uh, the next slide is one we've used uh, uh, different years uh, to give you kind of a snapshot of what your district is. Um, the Arwada is a resident weighted average daily <coughs> attendance. Uh, it's the, uh, the number of students that uh, the state assigns to this district uh, on, a, on an average uh, attendance uh, weight. If you take that, uh, per that number and uh, find a percentage of that for our BOCES, Schumannsburg represents about 8.88% of TST BOCES. Um, and your aid uh, in, the, in the current year is about 69%. Uh, BOCES aid, anything that will generate BOCES aid, uh, it's around 69% able. Uh, the number of students we have uh, currently in the career in tech is 55.1. Uh, uh, we've got like one leg of somebody, right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we're going to give it back. No, we really don't. Cut them. Yeah. We really don't cut them up, but we—that's the number we calculate. Um, so the current three-year average, we do a three-year average in our career in tech in order to uh, try to minimize spikes up or down uh, in your billing for career in tech. So the current average is 57, and projected for next year is uh, just shy of 54. Um, so that way, your budget uh, that your business official is creating. 
uh, for period. That's a that's a number that she can put in the budget and go with it because it's a it's a lot number. Actually, I thanks to the miracles of modern technology, I just accessed WinCap, and your final service request is 54.23. How do you like that? <coughs> Not bad. Huh? Uh, number of students in our exceptional special ed uh, program is just shy of nine. A uh, number of students in our alternative program, like Dr. Madison said, uh, is now in our, on our campus, not downtown. Uh, it's just a little over two. Excuse me, what's alternative ed? Alternative ed is for those who um, are not successful in the local district that need some other type of alternative education, whether it's the delivery. Um, smaller class size, class size, usually a little more intensive intervention. They, they, they tend to not be working well in the local district, so they come to our program for a little different delivery. And usually not uh, identified as a special education student, mm -hmm. although some are. And you have maybe 30 90. 90. 90. And two from our district. Mm -hmm. Shermansburg is looking at um, two in the GED program for next year and one in the transition program, the high school program for next year. That doesn't mean that couldn't change, but right now that's what we have. <laughs> Current budget at our, uh, at our BOCES for Trumansburg is about uh, 3.2 mil. And if you divide that into the, our total budget, that represents about 8.76%. And the reason we do that is it gives you something to compare the, the percentage up and above uh, what your district is <coughs> for BOCES and the size and what you're using for services. Uh, no right or wrong, it just gives you kind of an idea of <laughs> are we purchasing our size? Uh, some districts purchase over their size, some purchase below. But it just gives you just kind of a reference number. By all means, so you're questions. saying the percentage of the total WADA should be close to the percentage of OC services? Is that what you're suggesting? I'm not saying that it needs to be. It just oh. gives you a, a kind of a gauge of are we purchasing our size at BOCES? And like I say, some of the, like a lot of the smaller districts actually purchase over their size. Mm -hmm. They'll purchase services because they only need a little slice of something, mm -hmm. where you might be big enough to actually do it here and you don't purchase it from us. <coughs> you know, Ithaca might be purchasing under their size, being the, the, the size of the school they are. But it's, uh, it just gives you a reference. Our budget for next year uh, is projected up 4.54%. Um, and I know a lot of people will say, wow, that's a lot, but we're in a service business. Um, so our, our sales are driven on your requests. Um, so think of it as, a, as a, any business that's out selling services. If your services are up, you're selling more services. Now there are some, some amount in that that's just because of raises and so on and so forth. But being up 4.5% is not a bad thing for a service organization. Uh, that represents about $1.6 million in increase uh, for our, our total operating budget. And the number, the, the, the uh, items below gives you kind of a, a rough idea of where those increases and decreases, uh, the big changers are for next year. Uh, itinerants, uh, we have uh, quite, a, quite an increase in the amount of itinerants that are requested for next year. That will drive that budget number. Uh, Non-instructional support, cross contracts is up quite a lot. And you'll see further on in our presentation where those numbers are. Uh, instructional support is up. And our capital budget is actually down. Uh, a year ago when we were out, um, we were in the process of doing our second energy performance contract, EPC. And all the districts decided that they would like to have us just put that in the capital budget, pay for it one year, and get it over. It was about $318,000, $19,000 rather than to borrow the money to uh, do that work. All the districts said just put it in, we'll pay for it in the 13-14 year and get it done with and over with rather than borrowing it. So in our projected budget for next year that's not there because we paid for it this year. So that, that particular budget is going down. Any questions with that one? Okay, the next one is the one that you all get a chance to vote on. It's our administrative budget, and it uh, works just like your budget does with your uh, public. We put together a budget, you folks vote on it, and when you uh, pass our budget, then we're locked in not spending one nickel more than what you have authorized us to do, just like your budget works uh, with your local uh, people. 
So you'll see that uh, there are increases in our salaries and fringe um, as per contracts and per uh, uh, things that we've designed in there um, and things that like health insurance, TRS, ERS, they're all in that, that first line. But the things that we had control over, we tried to be very careful about uh, not going crazy with them. We, we really try to do keep those in line. Um, our budget uh, is uh, BOCES budget. Anybody that retires from BOCES, no matter what uh, department they retire from, their retiree health, if they're entitled to it, has to be put in this budget. So you'll see that our retiree health benefits, that is to cover every retiree from BOCES. Um, I was able to uh, really look at that one pretty hard this year, and you'll see there's not a huge increase in it. Uh, we did calculate in the increase that the uh, health cooperative has decided that was a reasonable amount, but then I looked at uh, there was some people that no longer needed it. Uh, they, they have passed on and no longer needed it, so I was able to reduce okay. that need. Um, so I tried to keep that one very, very close. So a total increase of our expenditure is about 2.15. Uh, yeah, um, a little bird here, but uh, those retiree benefits, how much control over them do you have? As in whether they can have it or not have it? No, <laughs> I assume they all get it. Anybody that's in their contract, yes, they, they're entitled to it. Every school district in mm -hmm. Well, and that's because this year I looked at it really close to see, you know, how many are going to retire that are going in. But then I looked at how many have dropped off that I can say, well, I don't need those anymore. Trying to say it without. He's one of the more he's one of the more delicate administrators. You really no, we don't. We don't. And that is that is a problem with all of ours. We are very fortunate. Um, that retiree health, is, if you look at that, is about a third of that budget. A lot of my counterparts in the other BOCES are running between 50 and 60 percent of the administrative budget is their retiree health insurance. Is that based on contractual previous contracts? Yes. Yes. We we uh, we've been able to get our our uh, splits what the retiree pays versus what BOCES pays. Uh, we're, we've been progressive with that for a long time, long be before me. So it's, it's showing, in, and I hate to say it, that that's a good number, but it's a third instead of half or 60%, which is what my counterparts are, are seeing. You have to remember, too, they don't have reserves for anything, right? Correct. So it's annual cost. Right? Correct. We, we assume some of our benefits in our reserve program. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. some, some, of of our reserves. Reserves. some of our reserves. That's right. Some right. of our reserves right. are targeted for that, and you run a flat budget. Correct. Every, every January year. or every July, we start all over, just like we're brand spanking new. Right. So that's part. Of, does that weigh into the way you have to budget that line yes. too? That there's yes. not a reserve. Budget. No, there is no reserve. Right. So, so your projections really, are critical. I have to project in there that if somebody decided to retire in January, I better have enough in there to cover the last six months that they're in. So I do have to. Project accurately. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Good, Peter. Yeah. Gary. The, this. So this would be Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, or health coverage of that nature. Correct. Prescription and drug and dental prescription. The whole. All of their retirement benefits that they're entitled to. Health, dental, prescription. And can you share with us the percentage that BOCES pays and the retiree? It depends. Pay? Most of them are 75-25. Meaning. 75% BOCES, 25% retiree pays. Most of them that are in there are that. Some are some are 90 10, depending on if they retired uh, quite a few years ago. But most of them are 75.5. Yep. Okay. And one thing to remember is while they're active employees of ours, they're all in other program budgets. But the minute they retire, they go in this one. 100% of them go in this one. So that's what makes it so difficult to manage and why in many BOCES around the state, that's kind of a ticking time bomb when all of that retiree stuff goes in one budget, which is less than 10% of your total budget. It's getting jammed in there, which is why we're, we're asking the legislature to try to pass the controller's OPEP bill to allow school districts and BOCES to put money into a fund that will gain interest to pay for your other 
employee benefits after they retire because that is going to destroy organizations like ours. And they just, by law, jam it into one small budget and it's the one you guys have to vote on. And it, it's hard to explain <coughs> and articulate that, well, the reason the budget is growing so quickly is because there's, you make these requests for programs, but after that person is done working on your behalf, it goes into our administrative budget. So that comptroller's thing, just I don't want to go, I don't want to take a hard left turn, but that, that comptroller's thing, where's, where's the money going to come from to front load? generating anything you may have left over like we would ask the supers ask could we put X number of dollars into that fund to grow to pay for our OPEB in the future so instead of getting it back in your refund we could put some money away into the OPEB so we would be asking for a list additional money to put into that investment and the so optimum time to do that is when things are good right so that when things are you can start using it but the optimum time for them to pass that bill is now. Mm. Okay, so other questions about this particular part of the budget? Yeah. We're good well, I left our, our uh, income flat. I don't see interest changing a whole lot between now and next year. Um, so <coughs> you can see where our, our final budgets are for that one. That's the one you get to vote on. So any questions, by all means, ask questions now because you'll, you'll, be, you'll get a chance to say yes or no on this um, at a later date. Our salary and fringes, we are currently in negotiations with our teachers bargaining unit, so I don't put those numbers in there on purpose. Um, but our health insurance, uh, we as a cooperative have, have uh, agreed to a 7% increase. That represents about 0.6 of, uh, of our total budget. Retirement this year is a whole lot better than it was a year ago. We had, uh, I think, 24, 25% in that particular number. Um, seven is still enough but it's, it's better than it was last year. Um, but, and the other retirement, uh, or not other uh, retirement, the other benefits that we do offer, dental, so on and so forth, represents a very small piece, about 0.13% uh, of our total budget. Our capital budget, uh, a year ago, we had around 620 some thousand in there. Uh, like I said, our uh, energy performance contract was in there. We were able to take that out because we paid it all in the current budget. So this budget, uh, the 307,000, is making the yearly payment on our initial uh, EPC of uh, uh, 2.8 million dollars. We we borrowed that over 12 and a half years. Uh, we could have gone out to 18. I tried to make that one so that it was a negative or a, a zero cash flow between state aid and uh, the savings in in uh, expenses. We could pay for what we needed to without asking districts to to foot the bill on that. So. We were able to calculate out about 12 and a half years. We're in that one to, I think, three years now. So we've got about nine to go on that one. Our reserve counts, like we said, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't have reserves as far as un unappropriated fund balances. But we do have some reserves <coughs> by law. Uh, capital reserve, we don't at this point have one. Um, unemployment, we are self-funded for unemployment. So as claims come in, we have to pay those. Uh, so we do have a fund balance uh, for that, a reserve, I should say. Uh, insurance and flex, uh, those are things like um, when, when uh, uh, our dental is self-funded also. So when we uh, have claims come in, we need to pay them out. So whatever the district, whatever the BOCES has put in there and whatever we've collected on behalf of the employees, we put in that account in order to pay their claims at a, at a future date. Uh, and also any of the, the flex benefits that uh, when they sign up for flex benefits, if they haven't uh, taken their money out of there yet, we have to put that in there. So we do have those set aside. And the Career and Tech Reserve, we also have it. We haven't funded it yet. Just haven't felt that it was time to, uh, to fund that, but at some point we do need to. Uh, and that's funded really based on depreciation of equipment that you have in the Career Tech. So that the objective of that is when it comes time to buy a new uh, uh, alignment machine that's $50,000, we've got money set in an account to go buy that. So the objective is if it's $50,000, you can put 10% of that a year in the reserve. At the end of 10 years, if you need to buy it again, you've got enough money to go buy it. You don't have to hit the budget with it. But we, uh, there again, it's, it's tough to start, start to uh, fund these when everybody's trying to struggle just to keep the doors open.
but we will at some point <coughs> want to start uh, funding those. Can I stay on that slide for a moment? Sure. I mean, one, you said you were self-funded? Yes. Is that a self insured hmm? Is that a cost-saving measure? Because we're not, are we? Everything we do goes to New York State? We work with... Uh, boy. I have to look further into it. the first time I've heard that term used in the unemployment. Mm -hmm. What happens for us is if somebody turns in an unemployment claim, the state pays them, and then they sell it, send us a bill. Uh, we're not. But you don't buy the insurance. Correct. Correct. So at any one point in time, like uh, three years ago, when we had to lay off all of the uh, uh, even start, we have laid off 12 people, we had a $50,000 hit in that line in one year. So if I hadn't had a reserve, I'd have been scrambling out of the budgets. So if we don't have claims, I don't have. I'm not taking anything out of there. If I do have claims, then I'm hitting it hard. Yep. Okay. Hey, can you share with us why you, if I understood you correctly, you self-insured um, in dental? Yes. Why? Are, why do you do that and not in the health part? We do in the health. It's a in our health cooperative. We are, we are all members of our health cooperative. So we, we, as board members, set the rates. So we actually, the districts actually own the cooperative, run the cooperative, and we can establish what those rates are. And your dental insurance is identical to that? No, our dental insurance is we pay the claims directly. Okay. In the health cooperative, we pay the, the health cooperative, right. and the health cooperative pays the claim. So I assume you're doing it with dental because it's financially advantageous? Correct. What, why is it not then financially advantageous to do it in the health? In the health department, if you were to do that same thing in health, we'd need probably $10 million sitting in that account. <laughs> because at any one point in time, if somebody has a heart attack, uh, kidney transplant, <coughs> and your claims are all of a sudden $8 million, I better have enough sitting in the bank. Our cooperative does. So it's not necessarily a question that it's more cost efficient doing it through the cooperative. It's a matter of do you have the funds to be able to Well, it is actually more, of, it is more cost effective to do it through the cooperative, and here's why. There's nine of us in it. So now we have buying power, bargaining power with, with Blue Cross Blue Shield. Blue Cross actually manages our claims. We don't buy the insurance, so we're self-funded. <coughs> They're our third-party administrators administrator. So if you go to the doctor, they pay the doctor, and we're using their um, their network and the negotiated rates that they've negotiated, so we're using their clout in order to get that. They pay the doctor, they send us the bill that says, I paid X amount of dollars for this person, we reimburse them for that, and then we pay them a management fee to process our claims. But by doing that as a cooperative, you know, we're $40 million operation. The cooperative is, if I was trying to do that myself, I probably wouldn't get the, the, the good rates, the good buying power that I might as a cooperative. Give an example. If you call Horsehead Central School District, mm -hmm. who currently is fully self-funded, and their family plan is probably close to eight, nine thousand dollars per family more than ours because they have to process all their own claims and pay everything direct and keep a fund balance on the side and they're actively seeking a third party administrator right now. I just got to listen to that. And so it's just a disaster to try to pull off in your own business office. You know, can they self funded though or not? Mm, no. I don't know, to be honest with you. I don't know. We, um, and I'll give you this as one little tidbit. Our cooperative is the owner of the most expensive claim that our um, our uh, uh, consultant works with. And they work with OCM Cooperative, Madison Oneida Cooperative, St. Lawrence Lewis Cooperative, and there's, there's one more, there's five of us I think they work for. We own the most expensive claim. Not a good thing, but because we've got the money in the cooperative, we can absorb it without hitting our, our our uh, uh, benefit rates going through the roof. Okay, okay. Dr. Manson, has there been any discussion of BOCES in central New York forming a consortium so it's not nine schools but it's a hundred schools? You, you can buy in other consortiums. 
but the, here's the, here's the deal you always have to bring cash with you you know so you would have to divvy up everybody's piece and you have to purchase a number of lives to get in you know so I've had to do this before another school district had to change health insurance plans and we had to shop 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 so we could find one we could afford to get into. And right now, if you compare our rates of where we're at compared to other self-funded plans or other 44s, which are those kind of health plans that are cooperatives amongst the public um, entities, very competitive rates. I mean, you're, not, you're not looking at saving millions of dollars if you save anything. And you have to come up with that cash mm -hmm. up front, which is usually the most difficult time, especially difficult thing especially right now and here's here's the other piece that gets involved with that is uh, regionalized uh, expenses what our expenses are for the districts that are in this area may be let's say ten dollars I don't know I'm just using that as a number but if you go to Buffalo they might be 15 so you don't want to get into into a reason into a plan that somebody else is more expensive and now you're <coughs> helping them put the bill so ours is very reasonable Okay. Onward. Thank you. Yeah, that's okay, right? We, yeah. <laughs> Seems like we were stalling here. <laughs> here. Here's those individual budgets for the program. This is not the administrative budget. The administrative budget is a separate entity we just went over with you. These are the program budgets that are pretty much tied to your request and the request of the other components. That's what drives these budgets. And you can see what is driving increases. And these are all requests that generate aid. Many schools are trying to generate more aid for future revenue. Um, so you can see, um, and trying to create savings. Our itinerants are what are way up this year. Why? We have school districts requesting uh, BOCES to create a share between districts for different positions. And we have more of that this year than we had last year. In fact, there's more than is in this budget currently. We had two more shares come in for itinerants last week after final service requests uh, where these people that are going through the budget process they say how about we try to share this particular position uh, rather than hiring a person on our own so we have added a couple more of those you can also see in our cross contracts people want to do some things again trying to share across both these lines have increased as well our CTE budget one of the things about CTE is it um, encompasses the largest footprint in, on our campus and one of the ways that the budgets work is every program that's on our campus has to purchase service from other programs on our campus. For example, they get billed for the technology services that are given by BOCES. They get billed for all of the maintenance stuff that happens from BOCES. Since they have the largest footprint, that's why they have the largest increase from those areas. This is good for you because if it was in exceptional ed, you wouldn't be generating aid. It generates more aid when we put those expenses into CTE rather than put it into the other program budget. So we're trying to benefit you by charging those at the largest print on the campus. Any questions about the program budget? Okay. Um, new and expanding services. We have expanded our CBO. Um, we have uh, additional people coming on to share the tax collecting. Uh, distance learning coaster, which is something that we have, is coming out of the VAP grant. We're going to expand the online learning coaster in addition to the distance learning coaster. We've moved uh, Play Doh out of one budget, put it into the distance learning coaster. Play Doh is an online um, learning platform that many of our districts use for credit recovery. Um, shared Treasurer, instructional technology support has been expanded in this budget. Uh, we've reduced costs by relocating the community school to the campus in the name of our alternative school, um, the, e the second energy performance contract, and we're looking at uh, shared human resource management requests from districts. Um, shared transportation maintenance service, we're doing a transportation study right now, you're included in that study. And early college coaster, um, which is going to be technology focused. Uh, we just had a presentation the superintendents did on Friday from TC3 that is a partnership with them. I also wanted to share a few other things, especially in light of the presentation you just had. Uh, we are working toward a partnership with Jason Learning, which is a nonprofit um, that on science and exploration, run by Bob Ballard. You may know him as the gentleman who is the explorer who found the Titanic and is mapping the floor of the ocean. 
Um, New Tech High School, we're looking at, um, looking at that over the next two years, trying to put that in place. In our, and we're having a presentation to the superintendents in May. Um, Pre-engineering program, we're investigating that. Uh, Mr. DeLucci and I have done some exploring on that and other BOCES, and also he's, I think we may have even found some partners to start moving that forward. Um, and uh, Mr. DeLucci has worked at the request of another school district to put in place an online entrepreneurship program to be streamed through all of our um, instructional programs available to students. Um, as they purchase, uh, as they, as you purchase services, so that in this, if you're going to be trained up for a particular skill, one of the things that's often missing, if you're going to, maybe you want to go out in business yourself to be a welder, wouldn't it be great to have some entrepreneurship background so to be able to run your own business? So, it was an excellent suggestion, and I think we've got a partnership with TC3 to make that happen. So by law, the component boards then have to vote on that administrative budget. It has to be between April 16th and the 30th annually, and that will take place this year on Wednesday, April 23rd. All the boards in our region will vote on the same evening on our administrative budget. Final questions for Jeff? Well, you ought to make the governor happy with the services. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, he, doesn't, he doesn't think we're sharing services right here. <laughs> April 23rd. Everybody. April 23rd. <coughs> yeah, we have the invitation to the dinner. And there's a dinner for April 2nd for the um, meeting. meeting. That's not going to go. We'd love, no. love to have you come to that. Great. Questions, comments? Please. For those of you who have been to our annual event before, we are changing the menu. Instead of the career tech lobby where everybody comes in and waits for me to say it's time, mm -hmm. We are now going to have the event in the Smith School Gymnasium uh, cafeteria. Uh, our maintenance folks have worked really hard at making that space more suitable for a larger group. So, uh, you, in the invitation, it should say that. Does it, Douglas? Hinn? Um, yes. Yeah. Smith School Cafeteria. Right. Five thirty p.m. But many of you have been with us before, so it's up on the other side of campus this coming uh, May. And much uh, more part. April. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. Great. Thanks very much, folks. Thank Everyone you have Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
tab elimination adjustment, which is a crazy maker. And this, and we are getting to the point where we need to present what really are difficult recommendations by our leadership team because it involves uh, recommending that we abolish, that the board abolish positions. These have been our goals as the leadership and head team has said, let's go back one. Okay. Uh, to preserve, we talked about this a lot. Uh, option A, we never really did an option B, is to preserve quality educational programs for our students. Um, and that's a greater challenge um, as enrollment has declined and um, state funding is flat or really not meeting our needs. Um, main, number two, maintain fiscal responsibility and stability. Again, in an, enrollment of decline, in an environment of declining enrollment in state funding, we have to meet our contractual obligations, and we have to respond <coughs> to mandated expenditures that our district does not have control over. Early enrollment is a big piece of this. Uh, you can look at uh, 2004 or five there, it's at 1360. Uh, the number 1,204 has significance as we move forward. And then you can see that uh, in 2014, we had 1,078 students. Kind of right now, we're hovering around that. So that's a 300 student drop yes. in yes. a decade. Yes. So it's 30 students a year. Our high water mark was around 2000, 1999, 2000, at about 1488. That was our high water mark as far as enrollment. So, the next slide. so we're 20% down. In the population decade. Remember the last slide, um, 1,204 in 2008 2009. Uh, Tina, our board clerk, did a whole bunch of work to go through all of the board minutes from 2008 9 forward to take all of the recommendations for abolishing positions and all the recommendations to create positions. And the the summary of all that is for our teaching staff that with an enrollment um, in 2008-9 of 1,204 and then dropping to um, 1,078 that's 126 fewer students and that's an enrollment decline of 10.47%. In that same time frame, we start in May of 2009 uh, with 132.9 staff members. Um, there has been lots and lots of recommendations for abolishing positions and lots and lots of recommendations for other positions, but the net total, because some of you are probably doing it in your head like, oh my gosh, we, we created this, we created that, we abolished this, we abolished that. But in the net total, we've reduced um, through last October 12.9 uh, teaching positions. And when I say that, that's teachers, counselors, psychologists, etc., not support staff. And you can see that with a 9.71% reduction. So we've kind of paralleled the enrollment decline mm -hmm. and um, the reduction in the staff positions. For next year, so going forward, uh, we believe, and we don't know the exact numbers because we don't know how large the kindergarten class will be. John King pulls up school tool and we came up with a few more students in the high school, but. Generally, we're looking at a decline next year, and, if, um, and what I have is a 4.44%, and uh, the position reductions that we'll be re recommending tonight come to about 3.96%. It's getting crazy, because when you get close to 100, one person is 1%. So it, it is, we are, I've said it uh, with our leadership team, uh, that we are getting close to as tight as we can uh, make this thing work uh, efficiently and continue to offer the programs that our community and our students um, expect. And so, Kimberly, let's see what we We'll take you through a couple more slides and then uh, we'll kind of go back and forth. We've seen this one before. You have, and I just keep bringing it back because this is really the foundation of where we started working this year. I was able to identify your birthday parts and say health insurance increase overall uh, for our district is at 7% and that represents a $184,000 increase over our current fiscal. 
Um, so I won't go through each number. The numbers are the same. Uh, instead, I would draw to your attention to that bottom number of 790,000. And that's really uh, when Michael and I went to the administrative team, we said all things staying the same with our current fiscal at just over 24 million. This is the increase that we are looking at, and this is the number that we need to address. Uh, so what do we do about that? Or with all of those previous slides in mind, enrollment decline, our goal of maintaining program, knowing we need to be as efficient as possible, um, state funding doesn't help us as much as we need it to help, uh, we are making these recommendations. And I say we, it's the leadership team, we have met um, I, at unnumbered hours, beginning probably in December, in January, and February, and now we're in March, we've met as a team every time, um, for the very most part, and each principal and John, Jimmy, and Cisco, Sarah represents special education, Kimberly represents all the dollars and speaks to the dollars, and Tina Lincoln joins us because she has that historical perspective of you've done this before or um, who's given the Tina a lot to kind of bring the historical perspective and also when you start talking about staffing, uh, seniority um, becomes an important concept very quickly. Out of all that, we're recommending, um, based on enrollment and, and everything else, that we reduce two elementary positions. Remember, elementary is K through six. So, um, and where these positions um, end up, sometimes it can be at our elementary school or in our middle school. Uh, a half-time school monitor, a full-time school monitor, another half-time school monitor, um, half, half point five of social studies, 0.5 in math, uh, 0.83 in Spanish teacher, that just obviously means more than half a section, so it's probably five sections, kind of that, and um, 0.5 English language arts, or a total uh, reduction in positions of 7.23 FTE. And I'd like to emphasize, um, and I know John King said it eloquently last year, uh, these decisions are truly made uh, with regret, we treasure our staff, we hire carefully, we nurture uh, our staff, build relations with students, relationships with students so that they can learn effectively. And uh, this is definitely um, a difficult and unenjoyable task for us. Okay, so if you recall the previous slide where I was looking at the increase in that number is 790,000 and 12 million into our administrative team said. And so the staff reductions that Michael just went over represent uh, just over 374000 In addition to that, uh, each year in the expenditure budget, we support our school lunch program. This, uh, past, this current fiscal, we are, it's called an interfund transfer that we take from the general fund and we send it to the school lunch fund to support that program because they are unable to be self-sufficient at this time. Uh, we did have a school lunch consultant come in this year and evaluate our program. They've made extensive recommendations of what we've already started to implement. Um, the savings from that consultant's report should be far greater than 26,000. However, many of them will take time to implement and time for us to actually see that saving. But I do feel confident that going into the next budget season, I can reduce that interfund transfer by 26,000, which gives us a nice round number of 400,000 from that $790,000 gap that we initially started with. The, the additional reduction, um, when I went to the support of the leadership team and I said this is the gap that we're dealing with, what can we do? Uh, they looked very closely at their schedules, uh, class sizes, so on and so forth, and they did the rest. And so we feel that the remaining portion of that gap needs to be found within the current budget. Um, the good news is, I believe I found it, and so at the next board meeting, I'll be showing you what some of those reductions are and which, which of the budget lines you'll see those in the most. So the good news is those reductions are not a direct impact to staff or students. <coughs> this next slide is the really the revenues of projection for 14-15. Many of you have probably heard the governor's projections. Um, what's the difference from the governor's projections? Or those are projections that he puts forth for each school district, however, they're just that, they're projections. 
Uh, they're not necessarily based on expenditures. So I'll start you at the local piece, and I'll tell you how our numbers differ. This local piece we have complete control over. The first line here, the yellow, represents where we are currently. So you can see our tax cap this school year uh, generated just over $10 million. For next school year, staying within the tax cap, I project it's at $10.2 million. Overall, if you look at the scan line, you can see some of these local revenues in the middle. They, sh they shift slightly. Um, and again, these numbers are drawn on historical data. And overall, I believe we can look at in our local revenue an increase of roughly 188000 for next fiscal. The next section in the purple here, these are the numbers that if you were to compare to the, gov the governor's projections are slightly different. And the reason why my numbers are different from his is that the governor's projections, again, are just that projection. And several of the areas are expenditure-based driven. So one of, the, one of the items that stands out the most, and I mentioned it several times, is the BOCES aid. You can see I'm projecting based on a three-year three, three year historical perspective. I believe next year we'll just get just under 1.2 million. The governor has projected for us 1.5. So we took a real hit there. Overall, you can see the difference between what we're picking up in our local revenue in comparison to the actual deficit that we will pick up in the state aid. And then down here, the total increase from our current budget to next year's budget looks like it represents about $44,000. Really insignificant. The gap elimination adjustment, uh, has that been uh, declining? Uh, ours has stayed the same, you can say. Last year? 1.4. What was it last year? Again, it's 1.4. And the year before? Uh, the year before I got to look at it again, I believe it's been about the same. Well, what, what the governor's been doing is gap elimination <coughs> reduction. So it's been said. I hear tell that. Yes. Which um, year is the first of that? And so it gives us a little bit more money to, to offset that. So I, I can show you our number for this year. This, this is where they attempted to give us back a, a, a slight piece of that gap elimination adjustment. It's 121000 <laughs> However, when you factor that up against the decrease that we will actually get in both these aid, it doesn't end up being a decrease, an increase of 121000 Also, uh, in our building aid, um, across. You can, there's the foundation aid, which is stays the same. Building aid. Building aid, okay. So you can see I project for this year, the actual amount we will receive is about 2.2. And for next year, we actually have to reduce uh, that figure by about $75,000 for reamortization of past capital project debt. So we're losing 75,000. That's not something the governor put in his numbers. In addition to that, which is not included in this schedule of revenue for next year, is that we'll also include an additional $197,000 in revenue in building aid. I did not include that this evening for this evening's purposes because I will have an expenditure in the exact same amount. So I felt that it's that bottom line, which says $24.4 million, which is really our revenue stream for next year, that will increase by additional $200,000. However, that $200,000 cannot be used to fund teacher salaries or pay for health insurance or any of those items. So I felt like to compare apples with apples, I really just needed to show you that without the capitalized interest. In the end, for fiscal 15, I believe our budget will be closer to $24.6 million. So just in the process, uh, our board meets again on the 20, on the 31st of uh, March, and then again on the 7th, a week later, and, uh, in order to meet all the legal deadlines for uh, getting information out, our budget uh, report card, uh, we need to have the board adopt a budget on the 4th, 7th. There's a budget hearing early May. There is a board meeting and we actually repeat all of these things again, maybe a little bit more detail. And then our budget vote is on Tuesday, May 20th. 
same night as a 5th and 6th grade concert. Yeah. So that's kind of what we have for this evening. Questions from the board uh, about Kimberly's uh, stuff? From the first? Well, there's a statement that the uh, final budget's not out yet, so this purple line could change up or down one or the other, and the legislature has its way because of the breach. That would be beautiful. Um, if I actually go back to that slide, what I didn't state this evening, but I have spoken to before, is that um, it was our hope this year that we could eventually wean ourselves from dependency on some of the reserves and the debt service. At this point, um, we've done our best, and we are not able to back out of those items this 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 coming up. So. Um, how I was able to identify some of the areas that I can reduce within the current budget is that we have carried federal salaries that come through each year in the grant. Uh, there was talk about sequestration, there were our funds in the past, and so it was always, there was always an effort on the part of the district to keep some of those federal salaries in the general fund budget. And we are just really at a point now where the budget is getting so narrow that we can no longer carry those salaries. So I was able to reduce some of those salary lines. It's just one of the better examples for where I could reduce the budget with having no impact. Um, my theory behind that is if the federal grant ever go away and those monies go away, we will not be standing alone. There will be a lot of districts that are really in trouble. Um, at this point, we need to keep the current staffing configurations that we have. Um, and so we need to move forward and reduce those lines. Okay. How do we, of course, one of our board goals is uh, to improve, this is probably more of a question for John than anybody, improve our math scores. <coughs> How do we do this, enhance our math scores, and, and cut half the teacher? We're going to reorganize the, the way we utilize our, the staff that we have. It, we face the same challenge in every, in every department. Sure. Yeah. But it's but a one of our board goals is that yeah. in particular. Yeah. You, you feel confident that we can do that, or should we just give up on that? I certainly wouldn't give up on that goal. I think what we have is we have to we have challenges, yeah. um, and it's a matter of working with the professionals that we have to come up with some creative solutions. Okay. Is there any concern at all about classroom sizes? Jeannie, do you want to speak to that first? Sure. Um, one of the elementary education uh, reductions is in the elementary school. Um, our current second grade has five sections. And moving to third grade, um, it will have four sections. And what I've spoken about for many years is keeping the small classroom sizes in K1 and 2 being the priority. Uh, we, of course, would love to have small classroom sizes in third and fourth, um, but it's a different, it, it's, a, it's much more important in K1 and 2. So currently, our third grade classes have 20, 21, or 22 students in them. Next year, um, this class will have around 23 in them. So there will be, you know, a good number of students in the classroom, but it, they've managed it fine this year, so I'm confident we can do that next year as well. <coughs> Other questions, comments mm -hmm. for Kimberly and Michael? Kimberly, the, can you just explain the difference between the center and left-hand column? Center, left. Okay. Center and yeah. left-hand column. What's the, the correct? <coughs> okay. <coughs> So 1314, the yellow column is that was the initial budget that we started with for 1314. The 1314 center column, anticipated revenue, those are the numbers that at this point we've updated in the last couple of weeks, and we believe those are where that revenue stream has really come in for this fiscal. And the, so the subtractions are from the center column and the right hand column. Uh, the far right subtractions are the difference between the projected 1415 and the 1314 initial. Right. So the uh, budget last year we're running, uh, or revenues, I'm sorry, uh, are not, or we're 100,000 behind. From black car. Yeah, so the state revenue, that number right there, that 195000 yeah, which really, for those of you that have followed the governor's uh, spreadsheets and numbers, you can see he had actually indicated an increase of 543000 
but when I look at three-year expenditure history uh, on our BOCES budget, um, we've actually spent less funds there this year, which then produces fewer fewer dollars in aid for us next year. So it's really more accurate for us to look at the true expenditures and calculate aid on that. And so you can see at this point, and I just ran these numbers, Oh, just less than a week ago, and it's projected that we'll, both these aid will come out one, I want to make sure I'm on the right line there. Uh, 1.3, 1.2, Okay, 1.261. So that's a pretty real number because, you know, we are in March. And comparing what we spent last year at both in comparison of what we intend to spend, I believe this is a very accurate number of 1.1 almost 1.2. <laughs> a three hundred thousand dollars swing for our district is substantial. Yeah, so it, it's important that those numbers are correct. How is our expenditure budget money this year? I know it's cold out. It is cold out. We're still waiting to see some of those numbers come in. Um, the good part, like I said, is that we have carried some of those federal salaries within our budget, so we do have room to make transfers to cover. You know, the, the public approves an overall operating budget, but you have the luxury of moving within those lines. So if we fall short in our benefits for health insurance, <coughs> we can pull um, money from our various lines to support that. We're fine as long as we never go over that 24.3 million. Um, as, as we move forward in future years, and it will be coming out with a three-year revenue projection, you will see that we will have less and less wiggle room. By me reducing those salary lines this year, um, that means next year we really have to be very true to those numbers. What our current budget will lend to is anything that we don't spend this year is called excess fund balance. And what we can do with that this year, and I'm, I'm hopeful to be able to do that, is to back out of our ERS dependency out of the reserve. And what that will do is it, it will allow us to have greater numbers of um, monies for future years from ERS. As, as we move forward, we will not have that access and we won't be able to do that. Kimberly, to come back to this, so the numbers on the far right in gray, they're the difference between the projected and the actual revenue in the middle column? Uh, the budgeted number. That's the budgeted number. It's not a difference, is it? That number, that number. The 188. 188,000 without me pulling up the actual spreadsheet. I'm sorry, this should have a header at the top. I believe this 188 is the difference oh, from okay. here to here. Yeah. I thought you were talking about the whole gray line there. No, so, in the center column is what we've actually, and to the best of our calculations at this point, the actual revenue we have taken in. <coughs> Not that we've already taken in, that we anticipate. Some of it we have taken in, but it continues okay. to come in over the fiscal. So, if that's a more accurate depiction of how much revenue we actually have, why are we not using that column as the basis for I the actually, difference? I actually use both, but okay. a lot of people want to know what are we budgeting this year over last year's budget. You'll see that in the newspaper, what's the budget to budget increase. So I can certainly run those numbers either way. Okay. Um, just know that I work with both sets of numbers all the time. Okay. I guess my question is prompted by if, if we're looking at a, so the, the, the 790,000 shortfall, shortfall yes. is in an expenditure budget, not in a revenue budget? That 790,000 shortfall is looking at our current expenditure budget of 24.3 million and, which you'll see over there, which is also the same as your revenue. Your revenue is the same as your expenditure. They have to equal. So looking at that number and then calculating a 7% increase from our expenditure budget on health insurance, what that new number represents. So it's taking, it's assuming all things remain flat and equal, except for those big increases that we have a hard time reaching. And so it takes the 24.3, it factors in all those expenditures that are beyond our control, so to speak, mm -hmm. and it adds that new number. And that's sort of your starting point to say, if all things stay the same or equal, what would our increases be? So those numbers you'll see now that we propose recommendations for reduction, those expenditure increases will no longer be 790,000. 
50,000, they will be reduced. Yeah, it does. I, I believe so. I think I grasped this now. Thank you. Okay, how are we doing? Okay. Other, okay. other conversations in terms of the staff reductions, in terms of what impact that has, uh, or in particular the language one. I'm. We've had so much change in in percentage of teacher for Spanish or French, I, I'm sort of lost as to what that really, that impact is or has or how many people that leaves in that department and well, all of that. Is, uh, or do we not want to do that at this point? I, I don't know if we want to do that. Okay, okay that's fine. I, I can assure you we've talked about it a lot and we believe that with the staffing that we have, we can offer uh, the French and the Spanish uh, in the numbers of sections that students need to have next year. So, yeah. You want to hear from that, or do you want to just leave? Um, uh, you can ask me if have anything to add, but we've really had a lot of things that we talked about as a leadership team. So. Things to add. <coughs> Done? Good. <coughs> We're exhausted from this. Yeah, I can imagine. So, I have a question. So, 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 the other elementary reduction, does that impact class size someplace else? Yeah, in the middle school. <laughs> um, it reduces our sections, similar to what we did in fifth grade last year and sixth grade. And so it'll bump class sizes up uh, two to three students per, per class. So, so there's currently four sure. sections in, and they'll go to three? Mm -hmm. And there's currently how many in fifth grade? Uh, three. Um, current class has what, 77? 75 to 76. So, class sizes then will be in the 25, 26 range? Yep. Mm -hmm. We currently have 78, 78. Or, I mean, 8 graders. Well, uh, and 5 graders, matching numbers. Okay, so it's open forum time. At this time, give district presidents an opportunity to ask any questions about the agenda. Operations within the school district personnel matters will not be addressed in public session related to particular people. Comments may be recorded, I believe they are, and responded to by the board or education at a later date, which we reserve, and then ask you to keep your comments to, to private to less but brief. People have to speak. Somebody's got to go first if they want to speak. Does someone want to speak? No, thank you. So, uh, policy committee. We have second readings here of uh, both the food service program, which is very interesting reading, yeah. when we can actually sell sweetened food. <laughs> it's very distinct. It says when the last meal is served. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? Roll the mail <laughs> store machine out right after dinner's done and get to bring it back during the day. It's a very interesting thing. Um, any comments from... Uh, look, let's... Um, Let's, uh, I need a motion for the second reading of these two policies. And a second? Okay, and discussion. So would the policy committee want to comment on this at all? Or uh, mm -hmm. Briefly, um, what we have suggested is that um, we have a policy meeting coming this Thursday afternoon. So um, let's have any questions, or if you'd like to send the questions to us, we will take a look at them. And we did make, uh, we did respond to Mr. White's suggestion that adults will pay for their bill rather than may, whatever the language was. Right. Yeah. We did change that on page 16 of 54. Okay. Any other questions about these policies? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Extensions? Looks like it passes. And Sarah? Do you think? I certainly could go now if under the committee, but I'm listed under the administration. So who is CSE, CPSE committee? That shouldn't be. It's not It's going to be basically the same presentation, both spots, though. Okay, so um, 
Why don't we hold that until it's time for you? Okay. Unless you guys have something specific you would like to add, having heard Sarah already, right? The committee met? We met. We heard Sarah for an hour or so. And we have a better understanding of the way her business works. Great. So did, did you want to tell the board? I mean, well, I, I'm sort of interested most in what they think first, how, how your update was. So, I mean, I'm just not a cat. I'm sort of interested what was surprising, what was interesting. I, I really appreciated having these visuals. Yeah. Uh, these were really good. They were very helpful. Very summary oriented. I get surprised. Part, part of uh, what I like about uh, what Sarah had to tell us was that how they preempt a lot of services anticipating what's coming up down the line. Uh, I, I know that we have some challenges coming up that she mentioned offhand. And so we go, uh, for instance, to the Racker Center to study how to handle certain situations that may come up uh, in the next few years. <coughs> It's good to hear that they're looking forward, they're forward looking. And I think uh, some of the services that they, they really work uh, with the students on really help to mitigate the, these special ed, uh, what you say, uh, how special ed children feel about themselves. So I think that's good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. That's high praise. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. So the committee thing seems to work. That 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 sort of thing yeah, is it's great. Well, well it's like looking at the it's complicated. complicated. The reports are not yeah. yeah. more handleable. Well, I and think it's it adds a, a bit of knowledge. Um, I feel more confident about what I see. Good. Because I think for the board sometimes it, it, it's it's sort of this big thing that we it moves around and it costs us money and we have a lot of our sort of staff and student time but we don't ever really articulate it intentionally, right? So it, it takes all of an hour. So yeah, just get a basic yeah, yeah, yeah. And and again, this is, yeah, and it changes. And it does have significant budget implications, right? Because we have to be prepared in many ways for the, you know, the student that shows up that we, you know, have to service in a really serious way. And the services we select also have significant budget implications. And I, I'm always impressed at how, how much we can reduce costs if we are very proactive. Well, so this is to your point, right? Anticip we're yeah. sort of out there anticipating instead right. of being reacting. Exactly. Excellent. So uh, this is your turn now. We've called you uh, this, Douglas. I think this makes more sense. Excellent. So um, I think we, we all would all say that, that you know that was a really excellent mostly presentation. So is your work on the board reflective of some of the changes that have happened? It is. Uh, I, I can't say that I have made any of the changes, but I can say that He's a marvelous superintendent. I'm absolutely thrilled. Everybody is thrilled. Good choice. Good choice. First class. Um, the staff is, is thrilled to death to be working with you. Um, very forward thinking. Seeing some, I just, this uh, collaboration between um, Career Tech, Ed, and the um, Blanking um, Alternative School is amazing. I just, they weren't happy at all when they first moved on to campus. They did not like necessarily. I mean, they had been downtown by themselves. They were their own. They were sort of with their own peers. And I think there was some concern about being on the bus with uh -huh. the special ed kids and mm -hmm. having to eat with them. Mm -hmm. And we worked through it. Tony DeLucci is just a marvel at, at working through problems like this. And he was let's pair them with CTE. And I mean, immediately, a <coughs> complete change in approach, and they're trying. They really are. They're very happy on campus. Um, I hope that uh, at the dinner, they will show us the video. That I don't know. Did they show the suits? The video or not? Of uh, the the new combined CTV um, alternative. Oh, good. The kids are absolutely thriving. They just love it. 
Good. Just, and, and you were pleased as a board member with his budget presentation? Very much. Okay. So. I mean, it's clear he's very familiar with the numbers. Um, quite fast over yeah. We seem to have some ideas about moving forward. We had a little meeting with him the other day. He seems to be at least thinking about what, you know, what kinds of maybe more progressive services they could offer. Well, yeah. I mean, clearly they need the possibility of perhaps adding engineering. I mean, it's, the whole thing is very exciting. We have a large campus there. It's not fully developed. Um, it's going to take some grant writing. <laughs> Uh, a lot of money, but I think it really has potential. We're looking for business partners. Um, yeah, there's a little engineering school right um, down the road. There is. There's also a little no. engineering firm right there. Yeah, there is a right down the road. Too. <laughs> yes. So, so, um, and there's an airport right across the road as well. And, and, and so, uh, the only other thing would be that the annual meeting that we would do yes. one more time from the BOCES folks. Um, yeah, April 2nd, no. 5 30. And it's always a treat. I highly recommend. You set the time aside. It's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And then um, again, Bill Baggett, Wednesday night. Um, it's five, Thursday. What is it? Thursday. I'm sorry. Thursday night, 6:30 p.m. Culp Auditorium. The be at the high school. I don't know where we can get a bus together. I don't know how many are interested in going. But I highly recommend it. Um, you, someone asked me about this student achievement thing that NISBA is doing now. And that's also Bill Daggett. And I checked very carefully with our <coughs> programmer uh, this weekend at NISBA. And it sounds to me as if the two programs, the one NISBA is offering and this one, are pretty much are similar. So this one being closer. They're both free. But um, that's in Syracuse business here this week. So. I would I would recommend that it's possible we go to this yeah. keep it local. Build that on a tour, but I <laughs> you have yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. I think it, it's really excellent. It's yeah. Marvelous figure. Yeah. I wish the governor would listen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you got something on the Central New York front? Uh, nothing's going on in Central New York except the um, forum. <coughs> so they're having one Wednesday, not the Friday, Wednesday. Um, however, obviously, I did just get back from Albany, and we had some very interesting conversations amongst ourselves and with our legislators. Um, it was a lot of Yes. Yeah. Oh, it was a Yeah. Getting pounded right in preparation for the budget. Right? Yeah, well, they actually have both. Both houses have their budgets in. They're being examined as we speak. And we'll see Tuesday or Wednesday, they think. They'll come out. Apparently, there's been more, far more contention between the House and Senate than they had anticipated. They went into session thinking they were going to be able to make some concessions and go along, and, and it turns out that didn't happen. However, um, we, we were talking earlier about the GE, and I did hear someone ask, um, you know, when are we going to pay this thing down? At the rate we're paying right now, I mean, he's, he's taking things out of us right now, um, it could go on for another 30 years, which I imagine might be kind of his intent. And if you look at the way, I mean, he's forever announcing that we have a surplus. Year, which we do. Well, guess why? <laughs> We've all been cut. <laughs> and um, well, bonuses are up. It's an odd way. Mm -hmm. Bonuses are up. Bonuses are up. But by and large, if you look at the budget line, Barbara Lipton showed us. Um, it, it, it's been phenomenal to look at how much it's been cut from various mm -hmm. areas. It's not just education. It's everywhere. Yeah. Um, and, you know, while that's important for us, and I think, we, you know, the gap elimination thing is sort of ridiculous, but at the same time, you know, what I was impressed for the months that we were hearing about you from our own internal stuff, that some of these, the, these, the, the adjustments we're having to make are population based. Yeah. That, yeah. that to a certain extent, yeah, we, you know, we could get that money and we certainly could find use for it to be fiscally responsible. I almost feel in some ways right. we are penalized historically for being fiscally responsible, yeah. at least in the more recent times. Yes. So, so, you know, I think it's good to pound our fist about the gap elimination, and I think we should do that. Well, actually, I do believe that both Senate and House are fairly firmly set on getting rid of it either this year or next year. They are not willing to uh, put up that much money. <laughs> Peter. 
Uh, it would that be nice? So you're saying uh, we would automatically have an increase of what, 1.4 million? Well, that's what it is. That's good. If they can, um, if they, if we can get it through. Um, there were two other pieces of his proposal, and I don't know how many of you have even looked at them. The technology piece, he wanted to bond out for, I don't know how many years, but well into our grandchildren's future for technology, which is basically at this point disposable yeah. after three or four years. So it seems, to, I, I, that's not going over well with our legislators at all. They're definitely opposed to that. And us, and this is sad for all of us, um, they are absolutely firm that we must not only fully fund, but also um, make sure that we have full day pre K, uh, excuse me, full day kindergarten, and keep K 12 intact before we even go think of going forward on uh, pre K. Although they all understand the benefit. So uh, we want to be made whole before we incur any more chance. <laughs> so what else from Central New York, Douglas? Nothing much, as I said, is going on. I mean, the only things going on in Central New York right now are um, the, the forms. The forms. Uh, there is going to be, and I'm sorry, I'm just back from Albany, did not even stop at home, so I don't have my <laughs> date. I'll write you a note. There's um, going to be another annual dinner. Um, which is, I'm really it's sorry. It's in Auburn at that huge facility. For what? For Central New York? Yeah, that's where the dinner will be held. And they're holding their president's thing on the night of one of the four meetings. So that's yeah. Did you attend a lot of that? The Central New York president's thing? They're good. I'm sure they are. Great, great chance of discussion. Okay, so good? Good. Board forum. Um, the Spring Musical Greece will be performed this Friday and Saturday at 7 and Saturday at 2. Tickets for seniors and students are $6. And Friday, and, Friday and Saturday at 2. At, at 7. At seven. Sunday, Sunday at 2. Exactly. Oh, so they got rid of the Thursday night production. Yeah, just Friday and Saturday night and then Sunday, Sunday at yeah. 2. Sorry about that. Um, all this week, leadership in action is putting on a color awareness week. Uh, where students are encouraged to wear a specific color to support various causes. Today was blue for child abuse, tomorrow is white for peace, Wednesday is purple for cancer, Thursday is yellow for troop support, and Friday is orange for hunger. Uh, simultaneously, there is a food drive being held to raise awareness for hunger in our community. Members of Fantastic will be attending Ithaca College's event called Sister Friends this Thursday during the school day. As a field trip, the purpose of this event is to celebrate women and girls of all ages and ethnicities. Thanks, Adam. John. Well, we were so well. Uh Mike and Kimberly and myself had the opportunity to have lunch with uh, Barbara Lipton. And uh, she's certainly uh, being a part of her past life. She was an educator. And we discussed things as the, uh, the rebate uh, program that the uh, governor has uh, put in place or wants to provide. this is the shared service. Save this tax gap and yes. we'll give you money back? Yes. Okay. I actually had breakfast this morning with the Scott County uh, legislative members, and uh, they're anticipating their share would be anywhere from $12 to $134 versus what the governor is anticipating as the $150 for each of the taxpayer. I hate we had delivered to Barbara Lipton the resolution that the board passed condemning the GPA here uh, a week or so ago. And uh, as I Is said, that we received welcome very from much, her? very much so. And as well as I had given a uh, uh, setback to Paul Pisano a week earlier, we and they're getting piggybacking on what Douglas said that uh, her opinion was we needed to take care of the K through 12 before we added a pre K program. And as much as everyone of you know, I've fought for pre K for an awful lot of years, and I have to agree with that. Um, she was confident when we left that the, uh, there would be a, a altercations to the governor's proposed budget. She thinks there's an awful lot of emphasis on his re election campaign, and that's why. And she certainly recognized that when you hear the governor make this commercial, that he puts one set of figures, i.e., the tax cap, out to the whole public. 
and uh, the calculates through our nine step program to be something other than she recognizes all that stuff as well as in one at one budget meeting we were two billion in the hole but uh, as you listen to his commercials we have a 1.5 billion dollar surplus so they, they're hoping for a different formula and on top of that uh, Saturday uh, uh, Mr. O'Mara is having an open house in uh, Watkins, I believe, at the school, which uh, all works on the that as well. Excellent. I, I think it's really good that you're doing this, John. I mean, this is the kind of way boards sort of work in a variety of different directions. Everybody takes their share. And this is, you know, it's something that we need to push on. I mean, it's something they need to hear a voice from us as we're trying to do what we need to do here, that you're there talking to them, and, and that this is carried by the superintendents, right? I mean, this is sort of a mantra now. They're getting consistent pressure about these things that seem to matter to the community. Thank you. But there appears to be a definite divide between downstate and upstate. Oh, come it's on. It's weird. I mean, oh. it's like everyone's talking we, about Yeah, because we need, to, we need money from the more affluent districts to support the districts up here that don't have the support, Douglas, so I have it wrong? Well, actually... I mean, it may not be what anybody I, wants to say, but that's what bring, socialized education well, yeah, is. I need to bring my material with me. It shows, actually, right now, that at present, they are receiving huger whacks than we are. Last two years. In fact, um, a very good friend of mine who's also on the NISA board um, has a year left. Well, good whacks on percentages, on a percentage basis. Uh, huge. Could you yeah. tell Rick Tibbs that? Yeah, that's no yeah. He seems to be expelling a different setup. Yeah. So well, well, but but yeah. what, okay, but they are less reliant on the state funding. So a percentage drop in their income they is are, not as big as ours. That that is true. Th this is the fundamental point, right? But they are also. I I am just trying to point out to you that they are not being um, untouched. No, I don't think anybody thinks they're not untouched, but they also have a different base yeah. to draw on. Some don't. Yeah. They have, I mean, just as we do, they have schools of all, Long Island, yeah, yeah. some yeah. of the yeah. poorest schools yeah. in New York. Yeah, that this is true, especially after the, uh, the tip. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will bring anything else, John? No. Okay. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's have it. So I got a letter from the Central New York Boards Association that's saying that their dues are increasing, I think it's something like $40 a year, which is, um, you know, it's, it seems like, a, it's $2,400 for the, um, it's $2,400 for the um, dues, and I think it went up 40 bucks. Let me just get this here. The increase of $40. So they're making us aware of that. I think they do, this, I mean, just what we pay them is worth the new member training sometimes when we avail ourselves of this. That's really worthwhile doing. So with that, we can move to, sorry, i got to get back to my agenda. This electronically, it's a lot easier to move through paper, right? Right, Peter? Yeah, Aren't you enjoying moving through the paper over there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, now it's your turn, Sarah. Special ed. Be before Sarah speaks, I'd like to respond to something Peter said earlier about us. I, and I, you asked about a grant writer. We actually do have a grant writer. Uh, our fed, every, all of our federal dollars only come through a quite extensive grant writing process, and Sarah has been writing our title grants and our Title II grants and our special education Ooh. grants. Uh, sometimes we call those projects, but they're grants and they feel like a grant because they're That's okay. So Sarah is our grant writer, as well as Sarah. Okay. There you go. Corrected the you. record on that. So you have a hand, we have these handouts, you want to just take us through them? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go through them quickly. Yeah, just highlight it, this is good for us to have. Um, the, I think the, the main thing for to start is really the, the, the level of services that we provide. So I'm going to start on that second page, Continuum of Services. Okay. Page um, 21? I'm not sure. I don't have yeah, yeah, 21. Yeah, okay. So yeah. graciously yeah. numbered the pages. Thank you. So we have the, our services, we, ha we have a lot of different services. They don't start with special ed, they actually start with RTI. RTI is how we screen all of our students. Um, tier 1 is all of the students within the classroom. Tier 2 are select kids that are pulled, about 20% of our kids that are pulled for extra support because we find that there's gaps in certain areas um, for math. 
reading, uh, writing, as well as just organization content. Sometimes that happens in the middle school level. And then there's tier three, which is just more serv more of those services. And then if they're still not making progress in that system, then they come to special ed. Okay. So then. And I kind of described all of that in this packet here, but I just wanted to clarify. The STAR is really those universal screenings that we do um, for all students. Okay. So the continuum of services, consultant teacher services, this is where a special ed teacher works directly with the student or indirectly, which means they work with the, with the teacher of that student. Okay. That happens a lot. That's a, that's a pretty... Um, starting place where we can differentiate material for kids and then have that material be given through another teacher to that student. Um, resource room services, you'll hear that a lot from other districts. We, don't, we do not do that. We provide the majority of our consult services and direct services to our kids through what you see as content area support or CAS. So when you get the um, special ed um, board packets, um, you'll see CAS one time a week, two times a week, and that's direct service for our students. So that's how we can really hone in on multiple of um, areas that they may have, not just one specific content. Because for a resource room, it can only be for one content. Related services, I provided a list of what those are. Um, there's a wide variety of what those could look like. Most common are speech, OT, physical therapy, counseling, um, skilled nursing services. Um, integrated co-teaching, I've been trying to do a little bit of history because Peter had this question. Um, you'll see when I get to the numbers for special ed, there's, there was an increase. Um, and I be we believe that it was when we started doing the co-teaching um, because that meant that we had more of an integrated setting where we were providing special ed services to our kids and that of course increased that line, that per the per pupil cost for that. But better service for kids because they're integrated as much as possible. Um, special class, that is, that there's a variety of that. We have 811, which is more a behavioral special class for those kids who are, um, have behavioral management needs as well that are affecting their academic, academic significantly. We also have 1211, which focus really solely on that academic skill in ELA or math. And then we have 1511 in the middle school and in the high school to really support some of those kids that we have um, you know, known that need, need that service throughout the upper levels. And a lot of those kids are the kids that we have moved up because we're keeping more here and not sending as many to uh, BOCES program. So on the next page, the primary goal is keeping a student in the least restrictive environment. That is the philosophy of special ed. You always want them to stay here. So sending a student um, having an 811 program here in Trumansburg compared to sending students to the 811 program at Bosey's is, le is a less restrictive environment because they're closer to home. So that's a factor in, in their placement. But we always start there. So we would never put a student into, classify them into special ed and put them into a special class. Never. Because they haven't gone through the continuum of services that we provide. I've, on the next page, I've defined um, consult teacher, direct and indirect again. And on that following page, integrated co-teaching. One thing that I want to note for this is that we have, we cannot exceed 12 students with an IEP in a co-taught class. So if we're running numbers that, in some of our grade levels, they are, they are, they are higher. If we have more than 12 of those students who need, need co-teaching, um, we're going to have to split. We're going to have to have two sections of co-teaching. And we're kind of venturing into that realm a little bit for third and fourth. We're, ne we're needing to really hone in on what those needs are so that we can avoid opening up another co taught classroom but still provide them services. So that's what we've been working on really closely as well as parents. And so some of this, Sarah, I mean, as we go through sort of the road of this, you know, everything you're talking about, all these services that we are in providing, 
is it constantly through the RTI thing for a lot of these learning disabilities that you're you're intervening, checking something out, looking back, how are they doing, are we going back in? I mean, I know you're pr talking about it as an overview, but there's this constant evaluation of the services, right? This sort of quality, sort of built-in quality control that I think maybe you heard in the community. It doesn't come out. I mean, all these things have to happen, but there's got to be a lot of quality control in, deal, in, in these environments. How does that happen? How does the quality control sort of constantly so happen? We have case managers, so every grade level has, they have the special teacher who, who manages those students. Um, it may be between 8 to 12 um, students per, um, per, per teacher. And so that teacher is really the source. They are tracking that student's progress. Um, they are also responsible for any changes on that student's IP, anything that that student may be encountering, having difficulty with, family concerns. So that teacher is really our go-to person. So they monitor them closely. And then, of course, we have our building supports that in each building, we are monitoring every kid, right? right? And so we're looking at, okay, so if they're classified with a reading disability, but you know what, their math is really low and it's not, it's, they're not making progress, doesn't mean that they get all of the special ed services right there. We can't do that until we've gone through the RTI process for that one area. So we're really, in, we're really, Pulling in on the skill where they need that special ed services, mm -hmm. and then if they need, we need to go back to the drawing board to add a different skill set if there's another delay in another area. So, and so this is sort of underground data driven stuff too, right? This is why you're constantly having these data meetings sure, and constantly yeah. looking at these things to Absolutely. make adjustments as you go. So, it, you know, I think sometimes I don't know. I, I think sometimes not everybody thinks it, it runs efficiently but there's so many moving parts that Absolutely. to keep it running efficiency is, is, is this constant through review. review of yeah. it right mm -hmm. and so then every year we have at least one review of the IEP and those services um, and that's one minimum typically we have two or three reviews of that IEP in a year especially at the younger age um, because they're changing they're evolving they're improving they need different services maybe we need to do an OT eval so we're constantly looking at their progress so, and I don't want to take a, I don't want to make a really hard right turn and get you off this, but I do want to ask you about concussions. We are building IEPs around concussions now, right? We have, I, I, how much of that are we doing? That is not, that's through, um, um, that's through 504, which is IDEA's. It's totally separate from what we're talking about. Okay. It's, it's kind of related, it's a special. You have to do an IEP. You do not. You do no. not. You have to be a formal plan. Yeah. It's a formal plan around the condition that, that the medical condition is struggling with. And yeah. can provide accommodations like extended time for testing, but it's not a classification for special education. Yeah. It's not a classification, but it can require aid and, and medical. It could, medical it could, but it's under medical, not under Correct. special. Yeah. And the building principles run those cyber fours. So okay. those are run in the building. If there's a medical condition, for example, a student breaks their arm, they need uh, technology okay. to... So that's what you mean by 504. It's a medical. 504 is our medical, and that's run within the building. So thank you. Thank we you to clarify that. We still use the same format, so it looks like an IEP, but it is not. So it's a 504, and it says it on the top, but it, we use the same structure. So it might look Support. Yes, yeah, yeah, for whatever those needs are. So uh, just real quickly, special classes, I've delineated those for you. What we have, um, we have one 811 program this year um, in the elementary school. We reduced that from last year where we had two programs. Um, so currently we have one and it's grades second through fourth. We have co-teaching, um, K-4 and ELA and math. And we have a 15, um, I'm sorry, that's a 1211 in the elementary school for ELA and math. And again, 811 in the middle school, that's grades 5 through 8. We have co teaching, ELA and math, 1511, uh, that's a special class. And again, in the high school, where we've had really expanded it to science and social studies because of the graduation implications for those students. So we want that extra support to make sure that they get through. 
Um, related services are on the next page, and that just kind of, like I said, that's a list of what yeah. those are. Um, these are the areas where you can um, identify a student having a disability. These are the only areas. We cannot go outside of these areas, which sometimes... But they have grades. Right, within them? They do not. These they do are not. the areas. There used to be a grade for that first one. Yes. There is no longer. It is it is it is autism now. And then I talk a little then I brought in the response to intervention, which is the RTI. And the tier tier one, tier two, tier three. And that's a real solid system that we have K eight. We have the RTI claim K eight. We still need to, 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 to make it the best we can, really. So we're continually working on making, improving that, providing services, and, and how we um, provide services to, say, a high school student compared to an elementary student. Just, it's a different philosophy. We have, to, we have to respond to the needs. So that's what we're doing. One-to-one uh, -one aids. So for special education, currently we have 23. We have 16.5 individual or shared aids. Okay, we have six program aids. Six. I think on your sheet I said five. five yes. I added the one. It was a TA a teaching assistant that I missed. And those are for health and safety. That is the priority. We have. Be, I think because of the um, the behavioral needs that are associated with the 811 program, we tend to need more because of that, because we keep our kids here as in this least restrictive environment as much as possible. Um, but we also know that it's a limited time and as soon as a student gets an aid, they are backing off from that support. Um, we have to continually express that philosophy and make sure because people get connected to their kid, so we have to make sure that that's really happening all the time and making sure that, you know, you love your kid, but you're going to love them when they're more independent. So. Uh, I have a question about the AIDS. Going back to the definition of disabilities and the total number of AIDS you have here, are, if a student is uh, classified and uh, required to have an AIDS due to a disability, uh, not necessarily intellectual, uh, is that reimbursed by Medicaid or insurance, or is that uh, part of the uh, funding that we get from all pay or OCs? Typically, those kids are high cost, and we it, we we call it, we stack we stack that student services um, and anything over I believe our threshold is a little over thirty thousand. Just about thirty thousand. Um, anything over that, we get one hundred percent reimbursed. So you pay the first thirty six thousand. Thirty. Thirty. Yeah. Thirty. Just ten cents more to be your dime. Yeah. But that go that speaks to um, the numbers here. You want that might not be a bad transition to the numbers here. Yeah. So I've pulled these numbers from the school report card. So that'd be page thirty one. Mm -hmm. So this these are the classification rates for our district as well as our area both these districts. And you can see we really fall within the, the middle range. Um, and we continue, we continue to stay there. The, um, on the bottom, the, set, the middle chart, we are hovering, you know, just under 15% currently. And then I've broken is down. There, can we, is there a judgment on that number, Sarah? Is that a, I mean, our numbers are 18, 19, 17. How much of that is the students? How much of that is the changing in the classification stuff? How much is I, you know, no look judgment our, if on you those look numbers, at our, it is what it is. If you look at our population, we have decreased by 100 kids since 5-6. Right. So, you know, I think we're doing, a, I think RTI is helping to support that drop in numbers. I also think even though we increased the co-teaching, I think that that supports our number. I think that supports that, that decrease in percentile. Um, because they're able to really be in that, that, that typical classroom and they're integrated and they're learning skills or seeing good modeling. And so even though we had to pay more um, in that year, it's actually on the next page, you see um, at the top of the next page, from 9-10 to 11-12, you know, we increased about a little less than 4,000 per student. So, um, 
and that actually from 08 to from 8 9 to 10 for, to 10 11 we increased you know about a little under like 6,000 so five and a half um, you know and I really think because of integrating and spending money in the right ways you know I, I wasn't here at that time but I know how I how confident I am in the efficiencies that we have now um, you know I think that we really make sure that we are classifying the, the right way with looking at all of the data mm -hmm. as well as always constantly looking at spending. Okay. Uh, questions for Sarah? So the board, the committee heard this once before. That's great. Yes, it's very good. Thank you, Sarah. This, you know, this is an area that I think for a lot of us has needed that kind of clarity on uh, the committee is even more in depth because that you know we rely on the committee I think for the nuts and bolts to keep the board aware of certain things. Okay, so with that, uh, I think it's your turn, Jeannie. All right. So I have um, three things I wanted to share about tonight. The first is to kind of update you on our shared decision making committee and some of the work that we've been doing. Um, our group, the majority of our group attended um, Rick Tim's session in Auburn and we learned quite a bit there and then went and um, with some of you to meet with Senator O'Meara and spoke to him about our concerns particularly about the GEA um, and we met last week as a team and we felt like we, we need to do more. There, how do we get information to families um, to really explain what's happening? Because uh, unless you know you, you learn about it, you just think that the district is just making cuts and you know there's really not a lot of understanding. So um, the group did a tremendous job in um, putting together something for families to send home to ask them to go to our website to write letters to the legislators. So the samples are on the website and our parents on the committee are really the ones who are um, putting this together. They, they made the copies to go home, they provided the paper, um, they have put these letters out in the community with places for um, people to sign um, and we're collecting the letters in the main offices at the school when it's at home to every student in the district and then the parents will be um, delivering the letters right to the legislators offices um, by the end of the week. So we, it was kind of a twofold mission, one to really get information out there, but then to really kind of collect, you know, we really feel like this community is one that has a strong voice and if people knew uh, kind of what was happening, we felt like there would be a big response. So this was at least a step in that direction. Um, so I really appreciate all that the, the committee has done and continues to do. They're really a group of action, which I love. <laughs> Sarah Asker is one of our fabulous community committee members, and as you know, she's very committed and comes to all the board meetings as well. So thank you. All right, so um, the next piece, I just wanted to tell you what we're doing, um, what we did at our professional development half day last week. Um, third and fourth grade teams uh, were able to work on the math modules and um, they're really preparing. They received the fraction module, which is a big deal in fourth grade, to prepare for the state test, which is coming up in like three weeks. So they really need some they, time. You know, got to do yes, plenty of time. So um, K through two, we really focused on ELA and talking about what our plans are to use the ELA modules that have been put out by Core Knowledge. Um, this year, all three grade levels um, are using five different um, modules throughout the year. And it's about 12 that they put out for each grade level. So we're doing about five out of 12 at each to, because really this year our focus was math. Um, so it was a great chance for us. Um, Jen Godendeck came from BOCES and kind of led us um, through some training, but then really facilitated the conversation about now what? You know, where are we at? And there really was a strong um, sentiment that we need to take on. If this is what our students need, and the students, um, they really like the instruction, there were definitely some changes that teachers talked about, which is why I think it's so important that we work together so that we can hear, oh, okay, you, you didn't do that part because you put this in, and those are the conversations we need to have to really, really make it good. Um, so it was a great conversation. 
Um, I'm going to a March 21st session, which is, um, you know, Sarah could probably give the session <laughs> at this point. <laughs> well, it's not even Albany. But I haven't had the opportunity to gather that information, so I'm taking a kindergarten, first, and second grade teacher with me, and we're going to go and learn all we can and then come back to make final decisions, with the goal being that we will know whether we're going to adopt all 12 modules for next year or which ones by the end of this year so that we can prepare the materials so we'll have everything we need for the whole year. So storage may be an issue, <laughs> but um, you know, <laughs> right? But we're we're really excited to think that we might have what we need like before the year starts. Um, the next item, which is very connected, is science because the core knowledge modules um, have a lot of science embedded in them. And so now what we're also looking at doing is curriculum mapping to make sure that we're teaching um, the right topics at the right grade levels. Um, we're having these conversations together and they will continue so that, again, by the fall we will know which grade level is teaching which topic. For instance, life cycles has historically been at first grade, hatching eggs, mealworms, many of you will remember all these fantastic things, and right now that currently sits in second grade, life cycles. So we have to make those decisions. Do we, we need to decide, we're not going to do it in both, or are we, you're going to do one part, we're going to do one part, but we need to make those decisions so that we're, we're absolutely sure all topics, all standards are being met. So. So that's what the day was spent? Yes, half a day. And what's this last thing? Science. That was what I just talked about. Talk science. Excellent. Any questions for Keith? Okay. So we have the consent agenda. Um, a through uh, K with H out. Right? K, uh, we have 11A through K without H. So I need a motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. New business uh, from positive promotions, 10,000 pencils. Any motion? So moved. Any second? Second. Discussion? Same. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, Lisa Collins, uh, costumes and costumes materials, $51.50 to the drama club. I need a motion. So moved. And a second. Um, discussion? Thank you. Thank you. All in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Uh, and Yvonne Parks. Uh, again, costumes and costume materials for the elementary school. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, we have a D. And that's right. So, sir. And I have a question. About? Well, I thought we were going to go on with... No, no, no. Only if the administrators are uh, intentionally asking. Could I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, this, this weekend, uh, obviously, we spent a lot of time discussing Common Core and issues surrounding these things. The only real problem people seem to be having was in like seventh and eighth grade when it was uh, particularly in the math when it was being introduced. Um, many many angry parents being reported of you know stellar math students who all of a sudden were failing their math exam because um, they didn't understand the Singapore math. <laughs> I'm looking right at you. Have, have we experienced yeah. that yeah. sort of? Absolutely. Okay. I think one of, the, one of the things that, well, it, it took a while to get going. Uh -huh. um, again, it's a new style of thinking, it's a new yeah. way of doing things. Um, the acceleration in seventh grade is very different. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, what you teach there as opposed to the Common Core, which is essentially accelerated. Right. Um, and so how, how that matches up then with the eighth grade acceleration um, and the algebra. So uh -huh. there, there, it's, been, it's been a hairy experience in seventh and eighth grade. I um, because I mean, it's coming on a line without any, you know, I can see introducing it in elementary school and, and working it up, but and I also understand why we're doing it now in, in middle school, but 
I sent like a failure train. Yeah, it's, a, it's definitely it's not a, something I had to even consider. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. a uh, jump in two feet first and see right. what bites are. So this is seventh and eighth grade. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, the, the same thing yeah, sure is, is what's happening with coming yeah. into the ninth grade with the kids right. that are doing the algebra modules. And exactly. um, I'll, I'll offer a, a reframe that Jeff Madison, when we when he was here, when we were talking, and I was showing him around the building and talking about what, what's going on, you know, we talked about that idea that the kids are coming in with so many students having not passed the eighth grade, the assessments, right. um, which you heard, you know, Mimi talk about when she was here mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, yeah. um, and and Jeff offered a really great reframe for me to, to think about that and he said really it's it's not that the kids are coming in unprepared it's that they they were exposed to a curriculum that wasn't aligned to the modules That's right. and so <laughs> it's it's so the issue is is that it's it, there is a need to do the supplemental stuff that we're doing and, and yeah. again and that's what Mimi has done a great job of working on supplementing but obviously we want to continue to do more and, and be creative with the staff that we have and Great. Thank you. Finally, I would just like to compliment particularly Jeannie on her work with parents on Common Core. Um, you would not believe how many schools have not involved their families and are still. Well, Jeff them. Madison spoke to us about this in this little brief meeting we had with him. That there really was a lot of efforts put out to sort of mm -hmm. let's, okay, you guys have said to us consistently. We think this is a good idea. Right. We should invest in it. And I think, as a chorus, we've said, okay, we trust you. The BOCES is providing the support. We've met some of the people helping us. And I see these like ridiculous things on YouTube with parents going but, like oh, fancy. We, we, They're we like the is, Common Core Nazis running yeah, around. Right. It's just so unbelievable. They're looking just to demonize every aspect of this. And, and I have to tell you, it looks like it's happening in another planet. Right. It's like 100 miles away. <laughs> so. Yeah. I think uh, what I'm trying to say is that Jeannie got the foresight to bring the parents in yeah. and explain it to them. Most other schools haven't done them. And actually, while we were there, <laughs> Farrell Tish gave the commissioner heck for having, she was just tapping him on the head saying, told you so. You know, we've got to get the parents always involved in a huge change like this. Yeah. Ever, ever. Okay, so we're, we're good? Good. Good. D. Uh, at the direction of the board uh, from late fall conversations. Let, let, let me read the motion and then oh, do that in discussion. Okay. So I need a motion to uh, sign an agreement with uh, this consulting firm of Mr. Mack and Mr. Caparella, uh, effective March 14th. Uh, I need a motion and a second. Second. Okay, now discussion. Uh, well, just really briefly, the board had been talking about this in the fall, and we did a request for proposals. We received this proposal. We uh, spoke with these two gentlemen, interviewed one of them last week, and, and the proposal's right here. It's, um, it's our recommendation to uh, employ these two gentlemen as our consultants for the rest of this school year, and then we'll see about the future. Any questions? Help us address our They're consulting us about what? Uh, it's around uh, district finances, uh, uh, space utilization. Space utilization. Yes. And uh, enrollment. They're going to take a different look at enrollment. We, as you saw, we talked about it so many times this evening when we referred to the budget challenges. They're going. They have a methodology that's different from what we've been using from Cornell to help us. Bet they think they'll give, um, help us better predict our enrollment in the future. Oh, predictive. Predictive and yes. But I think this is an operational assessment, sort of a general operational assessment. I think we're all thinking that, you know, what we and Kimberly and the staff was able to, the administrators were able to sort of pull off this year. I think we're running to the end of that sort of way of doing business. That it's just going to get harder and harder. And we've said this a many times. So I think we're trying to get an outside opinion on some things that are tough to look at when you're always staring at them like this and so these guys might give us a different look at it and um, they proposed something you adjusted it to the finances that we felt we could budget for this issue so other questions about it? Yes. okay all in favor all right. opposed okay so there you go uh, and this next motion is for Bonadeo's auditing services uh, between us and the board, any motion? In a second. Okay, discussion? 
Kimberly, you want to just tell us quickly? Uh, this is the firm that we have been working with for the last couple of years, so it's just a renewal to their contract for one additional year. They'll be here on June 9th, so we need to get this in place. It does represent a $500 increase over this current fiscal, but well within reason. Last year, they were Yes. Further questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Uh, executive session? No. Move for adjournment? Second? Thank you very much, everyone. What an exciting night with the robot. Yeah. Oh, that was great.